Hello everybody and welcome to our first lesson for the Philosophy Academy on the topic of political philosophy. In this video what we're going to do is ask the question what is political philosophy and why is it so important before outlining the scope of this series of lessons going forward. Now as an important point I would like to reference everybody the 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 image that I decided to choose um, for the representation of political philosophy. I could have put a picture of parliament or I could have put a picture of congress or or or, or some kind of protest but I decided to have a painting of what is the declaration of independence because one of the major elements of political philosophy is the ideology of liberalism that we're going to spend a lot of time focusing on uh, at the start of this series. And some of the most foundational principles of liberalism ended up being enshrined in the Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution. And so it really is an indication, a representation of how political philosophy, the writings of political philosophy, actually can shape the fundamental future of one of, if not at the moment, the most powerful state on earth. So it shows that it is a very, very, very important topic. And I thought that this painting is a nice representation of why it is so important. So we're going to ask the following questions. We're going to ask the question, what is political philosophy? Why should one care about politics or political engagement from the philosophical perspective? How can one unpack the moral dimensions of political decisions? And what even is politics? What do we even mean when we talk about politics in this regard? Those are all the questions for this series of videos. And all of these questions fall under the banner of political philosophy. And it is arguably, as cited here, one of the most diverse fields of philosophy that one can study. You fundamentally have the point that all questions of politics can be scrutinized from a political perspective and from a philosophical perspective to the point where any question of politics is a question of philosophy. That is one of the things that has been cited as a, as a reason for why political philosophy is so important. The philosophy of politics is something that people don't necessarily engage with on a regular basis fundamentally talking about the theoretical and philosophical foundations for political beliefs and why one should have a political belief, what ought to be the case, how things ought to um, be applied, the normative versus the descriptive in relation to political philosophy, all of which are very, very important, part, arguably the most important part of philosophy in the sense that they apply directly to the day-to-day -day lives of policymakers and the day-to-day -day lives of, of every single person around the world to this day. People are exposed to political philosophy when they have to be. Okay, so let's think of an example. In the United Kingdom in 2016, there was a vote, a referendum, on whether or not the United Kingdom should leave the European Union. Uh, more colloquially, this is known as Brexit, and it went um, about as well as we all expected it would. Um, the decision um, is a decision about policy, i.e. what direction should the United Kingdom go vis-a-vis uh, -vis its relationship with Europe? Should it leave the, uh, the European Union? Should it stay as a member of the European Union? This is a policy question that would have with it a number of important implications, the ways in which this could be achieved, what a post-Brexit relationship would look like with the European Union. Does European Union law apply in the United Kingdom anymore? What about European Union law that existed and has been implemented by the United Kingdom for many, many years? What about Euroton, the European Union's atomic agency? Do we leave that as well as the European Union? All of these are policy questions. These are sort of the, the, the brass tacks, the actual meat of the issue. But fundamentally, at its core, these are questions, and this is a debate, about political philosophy. It is a philosophical question, because what underlies all of these policy questions and all of these policy perspectives are fundamental theoretical questions, i.e., should the European Union be able to limit the legislative sovereignty of the United Kingdom? Is the issue of sovereignty uh, of UK uh, political systems something that is um, far more important than the perceived um, economic efficiency and economic benefits that are had with the limitation of sovereignty and the membership of the European Union?
do the do the uh, economic benefits more broadly outweigh its drawbacks? This is also a question fundamentally, as was unfortunately the case in the referendum itself. It became a debate about um, immigration. It became a debate about funding to the NHS, all of these different things. These are not only policy decisions, but they are also philosophical decisions, or at least they are policy decisions that have attached to them fundamental philosophical foundations. So the result of this is that we are thinking about political philosophy at the most fundamental level. It was a decision that was effectively a decision pertaining to policy, but was actually a deeply philosophical question. So one may be correct in suggesting that the political dimensions and the political beliefs are actually founded in our ethical and philosophical beliefs. OK, you might think, for example, that at uh, that inequality, for example, is a fundamental evil. And so you might suggest that capitalism is evil as a result of of that belief. That is a moral prescription. You're talking about morality at that point. You're suggesting that inequality is bad, it is immoral, and it should be avoided. And then you are also thinking about this from a normative perspective. You're suggesting that, well, inequality is bad. It ought to be uh, stamped out. It ought to be removed. It ought to be replaced. It ought to be destroyed, any kind of inequality. This is a normative question. It is telling us what things, how we ought to act and how we ought to behave. We ought to act, we ought to elect, we ought to implement policy that deals with and tries to reduce levels of inequality. You may believe as a result of that that capitalism is a major problem of this. And so as a result of that, you may have the informed opinions from the basis of those fundamental philosophical decisions. OK, it will inform your political opinions. You may be a socialist as a result of the fact that you believe that capitalism is evil or that you believe inequality is evil. You may therefore go about and um, start to vote and start to join political parties which align to your beliefs. And we go from, as we can see here, a fundamental philosophical and ethical belief in inequality being bad all the way down to your day to day voting habits and voting behaviors. You might vote Labour, for example, um, not necessarily if you were a socialist, but you might vote Labour if uh, you uh, if you were somebody who believed in in quite general liberal thoughts. If you were a, a, a communist, you might join a communist party OK, or go about doing canvassing for a communist um, association. You might write letters and pamphlets for a, a communist newspaper. Uh, equally, if you were a conservative, you might do the same thing. All of this is really talking about how we go from the day to day policy, the political decisions day to day, and we can realize and understand that these exist downstream from fundamental philosophical questions. And fundamentally, people come to the conclusion that political philosophy could just be described as a type of applied ethics, how we can take our ethical moral for formulations and standards and we can apply them to day to day situations. OK, what should be done about homelessness? What ought to be done about taxation? Is it morally justified to have a situation where we have people who are struggling to to pay the bills on the one hand and people who have more money that they can ever be able to spend on the other? These are all philosophical moral questions, but they inform your political prescriptions. You might argue for a wealth tax as a result of that moral prescription. OK, you might argue for um, some kind of um, formulation of universal housing or, or, or sort of state subsidized housing for uh, to try and tackle and reduce homelessness, all of which are, again, informed by your philosophical beliefs. This series will be less uh, will be dedicated to the subject of political philosophy. We'll begin by thinking about the idea of political ideologies and how these ideologies will impact decision making. OK, the political ideologies that we're going to focus on in this series of lesson um, lessons, sorry, include uh, the beginning with liberalism. We will then talk about conservatism. We'll talk about socialism and anarchism. OK, and then we will finish by thinking about feminism at the end, how these inform our decisions, what kind of beliefs these have, what kind of variations within those beliefs there are. So the modern versus classical, for example, or or, 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 or anarchism or anarcho-capitalism, for example, two sort of uh, broad and quite distinct theories within within the broader context of anarchism, for example.
We will then talk about how we can apply some of these issues and apply some of these decisions to actual issues in political philosophy. We'll talk about the issue of democracy. We can talk about the content of distributive justice, the idea of the state and the relationship between the people and the state. And then finally, thinking about totalitarianism as a philosophical question, a philosophical discussion. This is not necessarily all of the issues in political philosophy that we're going to concern ourselves with. We might focus on some other things and some other elements. We might focus on some other ideologies as well. Um, uh, this is just the sort of basic uh, skeleton uh, view of what this series is going to involve. In fact, we're going to spend probably a lot of time thinking about lots of other different issues within political philosophy, like economic justice, for example. We might think about global justice, but uh, from a quite holistic interpretation, given that I want to spend some time thinking about global justice in its own series. Series. Uh, but all of these things are going to be for the future and for future lessons in this subject on political philosophy. Welcome back, everybody, to our studies in political philosophy. This lesson is going to just take another brief overview of the subject of political philosophy and really get a better understanding of what we're trying to do when we when we think about political philosophy, as well as get an understanding of how we read political philosophy, what what kinds of things we think about in relation to reading political philosophy, the kind of political philosophy that we read, uh, uh, all, all these different things. And then just give us a basic background understanding before we start really going into the political ideologies that underpin the vast majority of the, the world today, at least, or at least historically, things like liberalism and conservatism and socialism and anarchism, etc, etc. And then, like I said, the way in which we're going to structure this series of lessons is going to be spending a good chunk of time looking at the ideologies, looking at different political ideologies, and then talking about ideas. So thinking about things like war and peace, economic justice, uh, distributive justice, and thinking about how these various different people, these various different philosophers would explain or understand these things. So, like I said, this lesson is going to spend some time looking at the fundamental elements of political philosophy, what we are looking for, what kind of motivations we should have in terms of political philosophy, the rationale for political philosophy. It seems to be the case that for those who are thinking of studying philosophy formally at university, political philosophy is quite a broad conversation that is often something that you probably cannot run away from if you are a, if you want to do a philosophy degree at university uh, and you say to yourself well i only want to do metaphysics or i only want to do ethics or aesthetics or logic you probably will find yourself um being forced at least at one point or another into some kind of political philosophy debate and discussion so you can't really get away from political philosophy it is one of the most important applications of philosophical principles at least in my opinion that and arguably legal philosophy as well, which I'm sure we'll cover in the future. So the question is here, what is the rationale for political philosophy? Why can we just, how can we justify doing philosophy? Why don't we just do politics? Why don't, instead of thinking about political ideologies, thinking about what liberalism would say, thinking about what liberalism means, why do we just say, okay, well, what policies should we implement for a better society? Well, <laughs> At the fundamental level, both political philosophy and politics as a whole, the, the sort of study of politics, is informed by a general sensation that we have, um, a general sensation that things need fixing, a general sensation that there is something that is wrong with not uh, a particular thing in question, but more so a society, the direction in which a society is going um, is not correct or needs changing in some kind of way. You might believe, for example, that we treat asylum seekers in a way that is fundamentally wrong. For those of you who are living in the United Kingdom, you might definitely believe that, given the kind of policies that have been implemented recently. You may believe uh, that uh, the way in which the country, whichever country you're living in, um, the way they handled the coronavirus pandemic was inadequate or was excessive or was uh, both in some way. Uh, maybe they did the wrong things. Maybe they didn't implement the right policy. Maybe the lockdowns were unjustified. What kind of balance can we have between the economic deficiencies that would have been caused as a result of locking down a country for for over a year versus the the the, the benefit of saving lives under the coronavirus pandemic. <laughs> 
you might believe, for example, that the vaccine mandate is something that is uh, an immoral. It should be immoral. It should not be the state should not be allowed to force somebody to to get a vaccine, for example. All of these things are questions of politics. These are all beliefs that will essentially boil down to the idea that something is wrong and we should fix how these things are done or how these rules are made or what rules are made and how society ought to be ordered. And so the result of this is what I've just cited here is a number of examples of sort of mainstream bread and butter politics, actual political politics policy based questions okay how do how does the united kingdom of great britain and northern ireland deal with asylum seekers that is a politics question that is a political question it is a question about the rwanda policy that is going through it is a question about the relationship of great britain to the european convention on human rights it is a relationship about um, our relationship specifically the united kingdom's relationship to uh, the refugee convention all of which are, of course, not only political, but they're also legal. Um, it's also a relationship to do with the sort of inherent, potentially potentially inherent xenophobia that exists in British society. Um, this is something that is historically very, very interesting. The way in which Britain has treated immigrants and, and asylum seekers in the past is very, very interesting. One of the main rationales and justifications for the United Kingdom leaving the European Union in Brexit was um, to protect our borders, if you will. But again, um, for those of you who know anything about the EU, that's obviously not how it works. But fundamentally, we're talking about questions of politics. But what is arguably the case is that political philosophy is something that exists at a higher level to that of politics. It is something that is more abstract and meta. The extent to which that politics, the actual idea of what policies one ought to implement, exists downstream from your understanding and your rationale and, and justifications for political philosophy. So you will understand that in a similar way that metaethics exists and what exists downstream from metaethics is normative ethics and then applied ethics, you might come to the conclusion that political philosophy is something that you do and you study and you get a, a good understanding of. And then from this, you get an idea of what you believe is right and wrong, what you believe ought to be done about society, how you believe society ought to be ordered. And those ideas are then enshrined and then inbuilt into what you think should be the correct course of action, the correct policy in a particular circumstance. When it comes to reading political philosophy, there are a couple of ways in which you can do it, okay? And there's no one right or wrong answer to doing political philosophy, to reading philosophy in general. Some people will say that in order to truly and properly understand philosophy, you have to read the primary text, the primary sources. I would argue, personally, that you probably don't, given the fact that People who are philosophers um, have been able to synthesize and explain ideas sometimes better than the original philosophers have done, uh, given the fact that a lot of the old philosophies that exist, people like Aristotle, people like Kant, people like Marx, are very convoluted and very difficult. Um, but you should have at least some exposure to the core key political writings at some point. So... These ways apply to philosophy more generally. Personally, um, for ease and simplicity and for, uh, and for speed, for those who, you who are studying philosophy, I would always recommend um, examining and reading philosophy from a perspective of reading textbooks and um, encyclopedia articles and reading, uh, uh, and reading uh, journal articles where people explain what these philosophical people think. Um, this is what I did when I did my philosophy degree, at least. Um, this is an introductory way, at least, to engage in political philosophy through reading the say a, a textbook a textbook will distill essentially thousands of years of political thought into a more brief and explanatory text not only that but it will synthesize the debates that are had between political philosophers about different political ideas not only will you just uh, only get the the works and ideas of one or two philosophers in, in in the primary sources if you read a textbook you will see what other people thought about those primary sources as well as everything else the other way is obviously to directly engage in the philosophical texts. This is more difficult, it requires a greater understanding and broader reading, it requires more time on your hands, if you have more time to do so, um, then I would highly recommend this as well. This series of lessons specifically shall engage with both. 
The lessons themselves will be structured on the basis of a couple of different textbooks. The two main textbooks that I'm, uh, I I've cited from here is the um, uh, Bird's Introduction to Political Philosophy, uh, the second edition from Cambridge University Press. This textbook essentially is going to um, be the structure of our lessons looking at the uh, the substance of political philosophy, the different ideas in relation to political philosophy, things like economic justice, distributive justice, uh, the idea of of of, of, of uh, specific applied political philosophy um, ideas, and then you have the Goudin, Petit, and Poget's uh, version of um, political philosophy, which is of course the companion, the Blackwell's companion to political philosophy. This will be our go-to guide for when we start looking at the ideologies. There's a huge section in this textbook which essentially attracts um, and, and has different chapters ad uh, dedicated to each of the different political ideologies, which is, of course, what we're going to begin with. Both of these, if you read either of these or both of them, you will get a really deep and um, in-depth understanding of political ideas as well as issues in political philosophy. Um, but you will also need to engage in some of the primary texts as well. The main primary texts for political philosophy are the following. You've got Aristotle, for example. You've got Jay Austin, which is a little bit more uh, legal philosophy, the philosophy of law, because it's talking a bit more about jurisprudence and, and legal positivism. But there's some interlapping and overweaving that can exist there. Uh, Jeremy Bentham, again, also something that um, Bentham's writings sort of intersects, uh, intersect ethics, uh, law, legal philosophy, and, and political philosophy to an extent. Uh, Hugo Grotus, again, um, more of an international lawyer, but again, also writes quite extensively in political philosophy and understandings of political philosophy, um, specifically when we're talking about the use ad bellum and the, and the use of the use of force and, and, and war and, and the, the, the philosophy of war. Hayek writes a lot about economics and political economy. Um, when we're talking about the idea of the state and the justification for the state, you will be obviously having to read Thomas Hobbes's Leviathan in relation to and in accordance with John Locke's Second Treatise of Government. And then, of course, when we start to critique the ways in which political economy exists to this day and the way in which political society exists to this day, we can obviously find the more radical texts, uh, writers such as uh, Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels, Vladimir Lenin, for example, uh, John Stuart Mill writing about utilitarianism, John Rawls writing about justice, Jean-Jacques Rousseau writing again about the state and the justification for the state, Peter Singer writing about morality and its application to political ideas in famine, affluence and morality, all of which are primary political readings. I've sort of done this in a, in a sort of uh, chronological order although there is a lot that is mixing about there we begin with aristotle peter singer's still alive today at least um <laughs> rousseau is a little bit high up on this list he should be a bit further down down with locks and uh, lock and hobbs if we're talking chronologically but even if you if you were to take these primary readings are you to read all of these different works and you were to read all, both of those textbooks you would have a top one percent understanding of political philosophy and essentially what we're going to try and do is synthesize all of these ideas into these lessons for you to understand going forward in the future 